Hi, this is Paul. It's always hard to know what to make a video about. There are so many helpful videos on the internet and uh, no, so many fresh things come out. And I get quite a few tweets and emails about this video and that video. Uh, Jordan's usually a familiar topic target. Um, he does put out a lot of interesting stuff. Now, in this video, he talks to the two men who put out a book about him. I remember when the book came out, I read the sample. I, After reading the sample, I didn't feel the need to plunk down the 9 or $12 for the rest of the book. Um, I didn't hate the sample. It seemed pretty much like what religious people think about Jordan Peterson. What a couple of Roman Catholic scholars would think about Jordan Peterson. So there wasn't a lot in there that surprised me. And because of that, I almost didn't listen to this video. And then, of course, the tweets and the emails started coming in saying, oh, this is one you should listen to. And I've learned now that I should listen to you about what videos I should listen to. Now, as I said before, I don't have enough time to listen to all the videos that you send me. But um, why not this one? And why not do a little commenting on this one? And... There's a lot of commenting that I could do. It's two and a half hours long, and I don't even have that much time to sit down and just listen to it and have you watch me listening to it, which I think is of more value than we might imagine. But let's. there were some things early in the video, and actually throughout the video, that I had thoughts about and comments about. So let's get after it. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much for agreeing to speak with me today. Of course they would. And for your careful work as well. So I guess I'd like to start by asking you, as I mentioned in the intro, I never had really envisioned being included in a book like the one that you just wrote. And I, I, I don't know. I find that a little hard to believe. I, I'm not saying he's lying. It's just I, Peterson in terms of what we've seen from him and testimony of others has always seemed to have a bit of a messiah complex about him. So I, I don't know about what he just said there. And I have noted that a variety of religious thinkers have commented on my lectures and work. And I'm wondering yes. why you felt compelled to put all the time and effort into this. I mean, it's a, it's a major undertaking to write a book. And so why this book? What's the motivation? And well, I followed closely your lectures on Genesis. And when I was listening to them, I was really... They're so organized. You know, it's nice and clean and little cups of water and they're well-dressed. I mean, this is, this is put together. Fascinated because again and again, I saw uh, themes that I had read earlier in the Church Fathers, people like Augustine, Chrysostom, Origen, and you were reading scripture according to uh, what's called the moral reading of scripture, where you're looking at the story of, say, Cain and Abel, and your primary question isn't, was there actually two brothers, someone named Cain and someone named Abel? You're not so much looking for the historical facts, you might say, in terms of Cain and Abel, but rather you're looking at that story in terms of what universal lessons the story has for us today. Now, right away when he said that, I thought I had a whole bunch of thoughts, part of which is that, again, because of the way modernity sort of came about and the skepticism with respect to a lot about the Bible that happened in the 19th century, a lot of biblical scholarship began to focus on questions of historicity. It's easy to go down that, to, it's easy to deal with that fork. Not that it's easy to resolve the fork, but it's easy to take the path down that fork because that's what happened with, with modernity, with moder the modernism versus fundamentalism fight. So a funny thing happened in the midst of time with respect to, with respect to Christianity. 
because there was always this question. There was this fork in the road that happened in the modernist fundamentalist feud, which sort of goes, did it happen? Yes or no? And the difficult thing that you have to deal with, of course, is always, what do you mean by it? And this actually gets complex for a whole number of reasons, much of which doesn't have to do with physical concordism. That's a word that I've used in the past that people have asked me questions about. And basically, it has a lot to do with Verveke's with what Verveke talks about in terms of a certain take on propositional knowledge that here, um, you know, thing one relates to word description. Like, George, did George Washington sleep here? That's kind of a thing in, in America. Um, and basically the question is, well, was there a guy named George Washington? Very few people um, deny that George Washington was real. And did he sleep here means did he lay his noggin down on a bed in an old house someplace for one or more nights? And if he did, in fact, then someone has a claim to fame that George Washington slept here. Then it's a fairly th easy thing to, thing to decide. What happens, however, in this conversation is when it comes to what happened in modernity and historicity, you begin to have, oh, let's see, oh, that's right, we can do this. Other issues come to the fore. And especially did God, and usually meaning number two, create the world, or does God, number two, exist, and what that has to do with us today? Because obviously, if there is no God, and if he doesn't exist, then there's no point in praying to him, or going to church, or any of these things that Christians have been making a big deal of for a long time. I'm convinced that a lot of these fights have tyranny, anxiety, skepticism behind them. Another video that I was thinking about doing some more work on, and maybe will still, was another excellent conversation between Peterson and Lawrence Krauss, and that's on Krauss's channel. And so much of what stalks these conversations are, well, if there isn't a God, then I don't have to worry about there being a God. This is something that um, someone I haven't mentioned for a while, Nagel, the philosopher, has mentioned. Alvin Plantinga cites him and quotes him in that, and I've read those quotes in a variety of videos two, three years ago. That's something that uh, Eric Weinstein talks about in terms of, well, if there is a God, then you have to worry about what's on that God's mind. And again, all of that has to do with God number two in terms of the agent. And if you listen to this video between Peterson and these two individuals, God as agent is all over that because God as agent is deeply assumed and that kind of talk is pervasive in Christianity in the late modern era. Because God number one sort of got substituted um, with nature and sort of displaced here so that God winds up being yet another thing in a world full of things. And we've treated that issue quite a bit in past videos. So I'll just mention it and not go any further with it. So... And that moral reading of scripture is something that is very, very common in the Christian tradition of uh, biblical reading. And so I thought that was super interesting. And then I also thought it was interesting how... Okay, and let's talk a little bit about that moral reading of scripture, because 
in my experience, most people, regular people, who sit down to read the Bible have that moral reading of Scripture at the forefront of their minds. And they've been trained by the modernist fundamentalist fight to put this other reading of Scripture ahead of it. Did it happen or didn't it happen? Because if it didn't happen, then it's just fiction. And Jordan will talk about that a little bit here when he talks about the new atheists. And Peterson says that's that's sort of a dismissal of the importance of it. So, you know, even though it's all sort of dressed up with fancy words here, most people, in my experience as a pastor, who sit down with the Bible, read it for inspiration, comfort, or guidance. And the questions of history bear on the questions of plausibility, really more than historicity, because if there is this skepticism that, well, none of that really happened. It's all made up stories. And then we're sort of in the land of Dumbar's, of Dumbo's feather and Grabthar's hammer. And that's been the tack that those who have come to Christians and say, first of all, I'm sick of your tyranny, so stop telling me what I can and can't do, and don't vote according to your convictions, and by the way, I don't believe it anyway because your God isn't coming to save you, because it never really happened. And so you're just playing with words, and but then if you were to pause and say, okay, so is that really an upgrade? So, okay, I'm going to give up my idea that my God cares or my God is coming to save me or any of those ideas. So what really am I left with? I guess I'm on my own. I guess it's up to me to marshal my own forces and resources and maybe to politic. And and that sort of lets us into what is an abiding concern of Peterson throughout this conversation and a good number of conversations in the second wave that he gets explicit about again and again, which is if you lose your religion, your politics will fill the gap. And when your politics becomes existential and ultimate, politics gets bloody very quickly. This is a point made by Miroslav Volf in his book, Exclusion and Embrace, based on as he watched the deterioration of the former Yugoslavia into the wars that crossed over that land. Once all these godless communists decided they needed to take charge of the right side of history, well, the obvious application of of the religious vacuum was kill your enemies. And so this anxiety is something that Peterson is very anxious about. And so in that way, that's really what's been motivating a lot of his concern about religion. And he wants to not see the church go away and religions go away and any of this stuff happen because he sees it has a role in the political sphere. And despite the time he's taking to talk to Bishop Barron and Jonathan Peugeot and and these two scholars, his concern doesn't motivate him to bother to actually do much of this himself. Now, we might say that if Peterson would start going to church and then he would have less evangelistic impact, well, okay. But at the same time, his lack of participation in this practice and in these institutions that he in these videos is saying so crucial also signals to his followers what is and is not important. So there's that. You were bringing to bear all kinds of other resources when looking at these stories. So you would bring in evolutionary um, psychology, you'd bring in Russian novels, you'd bring in all these things that uh, would seem to be foreign to the biblical text. But in a way, that too was something that was very traditional. In other words, if you look at people like Augustine, he'll say that all truth is from God. And so bringing in 
any truth from any field is perfectly legitimate in his view in terms of trying to understand scripture because he thinks that God is the ultimate author of two books, the book of Revelation, scripture, but also the book of creation. So everything in... And this is, this is just pretty much standard, standard theology that almost all of your Protestant, um, almost all of your churches will embrace. Creation can help inform our understanding of Scripture, and Scripture can help inform our understanding of creation. So these lectures, I really enjoyed them, and it seemed to me that what you were doing in a certain way was uh, reinventing, representing again in a new and fresh way the insights that were found in these older thinkers. And the fact but that doesn't answer the question of why Peterson was supposed so popular, and you know myself and these guys, and you know why in some ways other things aren't. If you want to see what is popular, go on YouTube and you can find popular preachers who, in fact, major in the moralistic interpretation of the Bible. And um, you might not, in, you might, you may or may not appreciate the uh, moralisms that they are finding in the text. This is an old, old, lengthy conversation within the church, and those of us who um, interpret and present um, and teach the Bible as a vocation. The fact that so many young people, especially young people who call themselves atheists or agnostics or religious, the fact that so many of these people were fascinated by your lectures and drawn to them, and as you know, so many comments in on YouTube would say things like, I thought the Bible was a kind of stupid old collection of naive stories, uh, totally meaningless for contemporary life. But after hearing your lectures on Genesis, now I see how these stories have perennial and are extremely important and insightful for it. And he's basically saying exactly the same thing I said, and he was attracted to what was going on them on them for exactly the same reasons I was. Navigating life. And so, you know, for me, what I wanted to do in the book is both bring out these resonances with these earlier figures, but also to try to show how these earlier figures actually, in my view, develop and enhance some of your own insights and move them further down the road, as it were. So I thought that it would be useful to bring these reflections together in a book. Yeah, I, I, I have the same uh, intellectual reasons as well uh, for, for engaging your work. Uh, basically, I think we're trying to speak to two audiences at the same time. One is to your, your massive audience. And Part of my thinking when I heard this the first time was this was, you know, well, why did I, why did I decide to make videos instead of write a book? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that, but am I disappointed with my choice to make videos instead of a book? Actually, no, because I think probably my approach was more impactful. I don't know how many copies this book sold. I don't know the impact of one book. Now, I'm sure writing the book was a tremendous exercise for these two individuals, but in the, in the videos where I tell the story behind this channel, at one point I basically came to a decision I had to ask myself. Do I actually further the cause more by making videos the way I am? or if I sat down and wrote a book. Part of the issue is that, well, I, I had interest from CRC imprints before for me to write, but um, my impression was that if I would write a book, my mother would buy a copy and some nice people at my church would buy a copy. I don't know if they'd read it or not, but um, yeah, I think actually the medium I chose is more effective, at least it has been in terms of, I think, gaining an audience and more important than an audience, because I don't actually think an audience is that valuable. It's building a community because getting having your say in a book is one thing. Being able to launch conversations around what's in the book and have that scale down to people having an opportunity to talk amongst themselves as it at it. So the book doesn't have a comment section. The book doesn't start a discord. So I, I'm, I'm still quite happy with my choice. Uh, to speak to uh, for, for engaging your work, 
Uh, basically, I think we're trying to speak to two audiences at the same time. One is to your your massive audience uh, to speak to them through your work that the ideas that you've been engaging with uh, such verve and such power and such clarity uh, not only resonate with the biblical con uh, the, uh, context, but in fact, this is where, fr from our point of view, they find their fullest expression. Uh, and so to that audience, we want to see, look a, a little bit deeper, look a little bit broader. Um, we're also speaking, though, to, to Christian audiences as well to see, look at the work that Jordan Peterson is doing. Perhaps he doesn't see it this way, but he's a serious theologian and he's opening pathways and opening. And again, and my motivation for my channel is pretty much exactly what these two individuals motivations were for for their book. <laughs> modes of communication uh, that can help us more clearly communicate some of these uh, biblical truths as well. I also have a, a personal reason for it. I, I began watching you. Uh, actually, I was uh, Chris introduced me to your work and I began watching your work online. Um, everything you put out and watch. And what I found so fascinating is from from my point of view, you're, you exhibit a lot of the, the, the Christian virtue of, of courage. And people were attracted to that. They were attracted to hearing. It's interesting how he said the Christian virtue of courage, because I, I think Christian boldness is one of the aspects of the disciples that gets noted in the book of Acts, um, them having been with Jesus. But um, courage, courage is not just a Christian virtue. Truths, including very hard truths. And I thought I wanted I want to dig deeper to see what what this phenomena, what's been called the Jordan Peterson phenomena, really is. Yeah, that it, this is a strange thing for me. This, the 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 popularity of those biblical lectures. I mean, it came as a shock. You know, um, I joked with some people when I first rented the theater um, in Toronto to put the lectures on. I thought I said, if I had gone to a bank for a loan and told them that my business plan was to do 15 two-hour lectures on on Genesis, mostly to young men, and that I was going to charge them to come to a theater and sit through that, um, they would have laughed me out of there because it's such a preposterous proposition. And yet it seemed to work, and the lectures have been quite popular. And it wound up being a lot more effective than as... Uh, the the guy who hired him for the job said buying a buying an empty church building and holding forth each Sunday it it worked out well. They're online and they've they seem to have attracted attention from religious and non-religious people, but basically in the religious vein, right? Even the atheists who've been watching are pulled in by the by by what is essentially the religious content. I guess part of the question is, you know, exactly what is that religious content? That's something we could, we could talk about in depth. I mean, and, and I think this is part of the reason he's effective because part of what he can do sort of outside the church is have the freedom to ask some questions that don't often get asked in the church. And the fact that my thinking is influenced by these church fathers, the church fathers and other historical figures that you discuss, I guess I get that secondhand in some sense, right? And probably primarily through Jung, Carl Jung. So he was unbelievable. That, that, I found that to be a very interesting comment. Of course, Jung was the son of a reformed, um, a Swiss reformed minister. Um, Jung, of course, had his own very interesting narrative about the history and development of religion educated and I saturated myself in his work and he was of course incredibly influenced by the thinkers that you talk about in the book and so um, and you mentioned Dr. Kazor that you know I was putting old ideas into a new package and you know that it's very important to 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 note that that's true is that I, I think he was really putting new ideas into an old package you know, truly original, truly original ideas are very rare. And so much of what we think of as original is it's built into the structure of our culture in ways we don't understand and then manifests itself within us. Uh, let, me, let me talk a little bit about 
Concordism, as I described, because again, I think that's a really critical part of the importance. I'm, I'm, hopefully in the new year, I'm going to completely redo my office because I want to have a setup where I have a little bit more space to um, do some whiteboard stuff and do my live streams and do all that. So it's, it's a little awkward. I don't like having to look down all the time when I'm drawing, but that's, that's, that's where we're right right now in this little, this little corner of the internet is, is right now represented in my little corner of the office when people come and visit me and they're sometimes like, well, where do you film your videos? And I take them into my messy office and I show them the corner and they kind of look like that's a little corner. Yeah, it's a very little corner. Anyway, let's talk about concordism because these, these scholars are correct in that what you find with um, ancient interpreters of the Bible is that they would often see various layers of interpretation and they would recognize various layers of interpretation. As they said, to a degree, Peterson was addressing the moral layer. And as I said, most common readers, most people, I, I pay, I try to pay a lot of attention to the people that I minister to. It's what ministry is, it's attention. And, and so I always ask myself, okay, when they sit down and read the Bible, what are they looking for? And they're usually looking for guidance, inspiration, what was the first thing? What was the third thing I said? Looking for guidance. They're looking for inspiration. They're, they're not... The, the modernist fundamentalist fights have sort of trained them to be... It's trained both sides because people sort of on more of the fundamentalist side of it are trained to be defensive about historicity and the modernists are trained to be skeptical about historicity, but seldom do either side pause and ask themselves what really is important about historicity. Some of you might have caught in my rough draft for Sunday last week um, this letter from C.S. Lewis to, oh, why can't I think of his name? Um, it's, it's his first friend, um, Arthur Greaves. When Lewis was, was wrestling with these questions about Christianity. Well, I'll just read the first part. What was holding me back at any rate for the last year or so was not been a difficulty in believing as a difficulty in knowing what the doctrine meant. You can't believe a thing while you are ignorant of, of what the thing is. My puzzle was the whole doctrine of redemption. In what sense the life and death of Christ saved or opened salvation to the world? I could see how miraculous salvation might be necessary. One could see in ordinary experience how sin, for example, a drunkard. So Lewis's older brother, Warney, was an alcoholic. And Warney would go on benders, as they say, and be incapacitated by his alcoholism for weeks or months at a time. And Lewis, both of these guys were bachelors, um, Lewis would then basically have to care for Warney. And so Lewis could have an understanding about how, let's say, the case of an alcoholic could get a man in such a point that he was bound to reach hell, complete degradation and misery. Now, if you go to the end of this video conversation between Peterson and these two scholars, the part where he tears up is where he talks about hell. And Peterson is talking about hell in exactly the same way that Lewis is talking about hell right here in this passage. But the thing I wanted to point to is that Lewis is making the point, which I have heard many skeptics and seekers and people struggling to believe make, even if I buy that Jesus died on a cross, and even if I buy he physically arose from the dead, what difference does that make for me today? In other words, this question about historicity is really not quite the thing that we imagine it should be. In many ways, it's a product of the fundamentalist modernist fight. Now, I'm not saying that to 
redo the modernist bias of skepticism or to antagonize the fundamentalist bias about historicity as we understand it, but merely to point out that while this fight is, fight is going on, fairly few people pause and ask, what is historicity for? And, and again, the church fathers and, and many others through history, whether they did it intentionally or not, tended to understand that texts that texts serve on various levels pretty much automatically. So concordism. What concordism talks about is a concord, an agreement between two things. And what has been obsessing much of Christianity for the last hundred plus years has been the question of how does this text concord with our life today? And because the modernists were skeptical about history, the fundamentalists doubled down on it. And that's where you tend to get things like creation science, where everything had to relate in a certain way. This is also where you get the theological movement of dispensationalism, because everything in the Old Testament, all of that prophecy had to be, now I'm going to use the word and then I'm going to say why I don't like that word, but I'm going to use it because Peterson uses it throughout this video and people commonly use it, literally fulfilled. And I think what they really should say is physically fulfilled. You have all these visions of Israel after the exile and the exaltation of Jerusalem and, and all of these visions. And dispensationalism came along in the modernist period as a response to modernism, um, theological modernism, and said, no, we're going to double down on all of this physicalist concordism. So concordism, physicalist, and so then you get creation science where you're always looking for physicalist concordism between the text and what really happened. Now, there are huge issues with this that are are completely apart from questions about evolution. Part of it has to do with the way narrative and attention and observation work. Because with texts, as with as few texts as we have, with very little history around them, sort of like when people attempt to create a movie about the Bible, you have to fill things in with something. And so you'll see this all the time with Christian movies, even the movies that try to, we're just going to have Jesus say what we find in the Gospel of Matthew or in the Gospel of John. You can sort of push away the whole synoptic problem issue to the side. And, well, we're going to describe what happened. But even when you have you just look at the George Floyd trial, the Ritterhouse trial, look at almost any event that is that people deem as being important. The question of what really happened. A number of years ago, there was the Alien Gonzalez situation where there's a photograph of a a government a government official taking Alien Gonzalez away from the arms of his father. And as many people have noted, um, a picture may be worth a thousand word, words, but pictures can lie as much as anything. And that doesn't mean that the picture was necessarily, necessarily doctored, but it talks about the fact that there's a whole range of things that go into understanding that go far beyond physical concordism. And what that scholar was saying is that a tr physical concordism, since the fundamentalist modernist debates, have obsessed, 
not only scholars in the church, but readers of the church, of uh, listen, people listening to sermons. Now, what Peterson does really is do psychological concordism. That's essentially what Peterson does with his biblical lectures. And it's obvious from the biblical series that he'd been thinking about these issues for a very long time. And he says in the lectures again and again and again, I'm talking about these psychologically, and especially with Jung's influence, is a totally different thing. And it worked. Peterson is a a very convincing preacher. And what I think this really did for, for many people was basically reestablish credibility. And credibility is what a lot of this really is about. The physicalist concordist arguments are in some ways for many people beside the point. Because again, what are people looking for? People are looking for inspiration. And the concordism that you want with respect to inspiration is, can the intervening God of Israel rescue me? They're looking for comfort. There is the third one which is similar to that, does God care about me? And they're looking for moral guidance. And that moral guidance has everything to do with another kind of concordism, which really isn't physical. It's probably closer to psychological. It has to do with to what degree does morality line up with success? And I know some of you are going to be really excited as I write down natural law. Because in this context, well, if moral guidance is all about, oh, I'm moving that thing. If moral guidance is what I need in order to align myself properly with the way the world works, I can have success, and this very much is connected with wisdom. So this is a big, a big part of the reason why Peterson, his ideas were fresh to most of us, but it was a concordism, it was a psychological concordism that lent itself to moral guidance with respect to natural law, or created order, as we Dutch Calvinists prefer. But this is part of the reason that it triggered the kind of excitement that it did. And that's certainly the case with these, these biblical stories. And I, I wanted to make another comment, too, about truth. You know, Dr. Kayser, you mentioned that I engage in a moral reading of Scripture, say, rather than a literalist reading. And maybe we should have a talk about that because... Because now he's going to talk basically about physical concordism, which when we use this word literal, which is really a bad word for it because literal is close to literary, it's physical concordism. This has been the obsession, and so we're going to have to talk about this. Because it isn't easy to read a book like the Bible literally because it's full of of literal contradictions, and it whatever it is, especially the really archaic stories in, in Genesis, whatever it is, it's not, it's not history the way we think of history. And so that's... And, and he's exactly right. And the point that he's making here was essentially the point that was made to me when I was at in my own conservative reformed seminary, Calvin Seminary, when I remember the, about the first day we had our synoptics class, David Horda, who was my, one of my New Testament professors, stood up and said, now, there are certain ways to approach the um, synoptic question, which is that, well, there's all these 
questions that arise out of these different testimonies of events in history, and there are gaps between them, and what has happened in, he didn't use these words, but what has happened in the fundamentalist modernist fight is that people felt the need to go through and clean up and in a sense to invent a third, a fourth story that has all of the physicalist concordance issues cleaned up between these three testimonies. And he basically said, that's a thankless, endless game that really doesn't do much because it's all in the modernist period an attempt to pursue credibility and it almost always fails. Not that people who don't believe that their project in this has been successful don't feel inspired or strengthened in, their, in the credibility of the scriptures as they know it. No, that, that happens all the time. But the problem is that if you spend too much time on this, the text itself is of less and less value to you. And this is part of the reason Jonathan Peugeot's Peugeot almost, you know, often dumps on modern grammatical historical scholarship because what we're really interested in again is the moral the moral guidance and the natural law or created order or moral order concordism that we have an authoritative word given to us to direct our actions but really once you go into there you're really in the realm of wisdom and wisdom is a very big deal but that's again why in many respects although you can still find plenty of debates on the internet that want to go on and on about physical concordism the questions of moral concordism how we should live our lives are really much more the questions of our day that's hard for people it's hard for people to see how that might still be true if it's not literal how can it be true right and this is exactly the retraining of the assumptions of the vast majority of the populations of the West. Now, I, I'm not going to say that ancient people didn't care about physical concordism. Of course they did. Did they care about moral concordism? Yes, indeed. They cared about all these things. But there are far harder questions about how, when they wrote, did they did they give their testimonies? And again, as these two scholars are going to say, this has been standard stuff in theological conversation, questions about genre, questions about communication. This has all been standard for a very long time. And this is a discussion that I tried to have with Sam Harris a lot, because the atheist types, the rationalist types, there's something they miss. And what they miss is that fiction isn't false. It's not a lie, right? It's not literal, but it's not a lie. And great fiction is true, but it never happened. So how can it be true? And the answer to that is something like, well, there are patterns in things, deep patterns, deep recurring patterns. You know, human nature, the fact that we're human, that, that the humanity itself is a recurring pattern. It has characteristic shape. And great fiction describes the shape of that pattern. And the greatest of fiction, the greater fiction becomes, the more it is religious in nature. And Okay. That, I, w I want to pause there because what he just said at the end there is really important. But before that, I think this actually is a lot of the contribution that Peterson made. And now he's not the only person that has made this, but he made it in a compelling and I think a fresh way given all of the thinking that he had done about psychology and wisdom and moral guidance. Because even if you go back to his his university lectures, they are full of moral guidance. So let's let's sort of divide things in this way. So you have, basically you had fundamentalists being very concerned 
about physicalist concordism. And they're, again, now the points they really wanted to make were moral, but because of credibility issues, because every all of this is about credibility, they wanted to make moral issues. They found their credibility by virtue of historicity and physical concordism. And that's not a bad thing because, of course, I mean, you hear me make these arguments a lot with respect to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I think that physical concordism with respect to the testimony of the apostles about the resurrection of Jesus Christ is absolutely foundational for the Christian faith and how I live my life morally. I can't say it any clearer than that. The modernists tended to say things like, this is a myth, and what they meant by myth is not, of course, there's there's one sense in which a myth is a story you can live within, and there's another sense of myth, which is just a very large story that may or may not have any relationship to physical concordism. And there's all sorts of questions about the Old Testament, um, the historicity of Moses, the historicity of the Sinai event, all of these historicity questions. And what tended to happen was that once the credibility of these questions came under fire, it left open a space for a lot more justification of moral retooling. And the fundamentalists were watching this. And for that reason, sort of the way that this this polarization and this feud happened was through this entire dynamic. Now, Peterson comes in the middle, and he sort of has a middle position. Because on one hand, I think he quite wisely says to the fundamentalists, of whom you know, some are his fans, I'm going to set historical questions to the side. I'm not going to pass judgment on them, which what happened with the modernists is that they were very skeptical about them. And part of your bona fides in the modernist side of things was declaring your skepticism. Because anybody who didn't declare their skepticism about it was a rube, okay? So there you had class pressure. And of course, and we see the echoes of this that continues in our politics today. If you go back and watch Donald Trump, I I don't remember a lot of his shows from The Apprentice, that reality show that he did on TV. I remember when one individual who was a white guy basically made a condescending word. I don't remember if it was white trash or what it was, but I remember Donald Trump stopping him there because, and Donald Trump was upset and almost fired him on the spot. You're fired. Why? And Donald Trump basically made a little moral speech where I can't stand that kind of condescension. Now, of course, Donald Trump um, would use all sorts of other types of condescension, but Part of what Donald Trump understood, which was politically enormously shrewd, is that you can find a willing audience among people who have been oppressed. Does that sound wokish? There are many kinds of oppression of all kinds of people of various colors and cultures and socioeconomic status, okay? And there's one thing that oppressed people really have and can milk sometimes, it's grievance. And so what happened in the modernist fundamentalist fight is that the modernists, well, we're all skeptical. We're And the more skeptical of our tribe, the more status you will have. Well, guess what happened on the other side? The fundamentalist said, no, we're doubling down. We're doubling down on our physical concordism. And so the more literal it happened, the more status we have on our side. 
the victim of this fight is the Bible. Because what neither side, what, while both sides are sort of playing status games, neither side are basically saying, well, maybe we should try and let the Bible interpret itself and try and try to figure out how ancients approach this text. Now, now that's an almost, that's a very difficult thing to do. Now, a little bit later, one of these scholars will talk about authorial intent. That's another difficulty because it's very clear, in all fairness to my Jewish friends, um, New Testament writers don't necessarily give a fig about authorial intent. Authorial intent was another issue that comes up in the question about interpretation of text. The further they go down the road to try to nail it down to something. So physical concordism is one way to sort of substantiate a text. As I said, psychological concordism, which is what Peterson did, is another way to afford credibility of the text. But what Peterson had to do to make his psychological credibility work was that he basically... said, well, it's a perennial. I'm going to misspell a lot of things. It's a perennial issue. Don't worry about historicity too much, but I'm not going to make comments about it because I don't know, which is actually a tremendously wise thing to say because truth is what we have from ancient writers are what they left us. But how they thought and how they articulate, there are many things in the Bible which, if you become a really picky physical concordist, will give you problems. The synoptics are just an element of that. And they're in some ways the most stark element of it because it's very clear that the writers of the synoptics wanted to emphasize eyewitness testimony. But anybody who deals in eyewitness testimony knows you're going to have multiple witnesses give different eyewitness testimonies, and there are going to be niggling little conflicts within those testimonies. But that doesn't mean that something really didn't happen. Just because you get three different reports, we have accidents all the time here on Florin Road. Just because you get three different reports of an accident that three people actually saw doesn't mean that the accident didn't happen if there are differences between their stories. In fact, human observation is such that you should almost expect differences in their stories. Differences do not really necessarily undermine credibility. We know this. But credibility has a lot to do with these questions of moral navigation in a created order, or let's say with respect to natural law. So that's how all these issues are sort of holding together. And so what Peterson does is he affords a different channel. That's, there's a lot of third wayism if you get involved with, you know, reformed theology or almost any theological debate in the church because once you have one thing, another thing arises and you have a whole bunch of opponent processing between them. And often what happens is that someone points out a third way. And so this is exactly what Peterson does in his biblical lectures. It's really a third wayism, And he gets at this whole moral issue, and but he's doing it sort of through a perennialism that says, well, human nature sort of stays the same. All these psychological issues sort of stay the same. And what the reason that the text has credibility is because we can see how all of this is true. So therefore, the Bible is a faithful source of information and ancient wisdom based on a tremendous history and a tremendous amount of testimony and reflection and ancient wisdom about how one should navigate in the world. Now, this sort of sets up 
Brett Weinstein's pushback, which is, well, things have changed. Well, okay, that's a fair that's a fair statement, but it's just as fair to come back and say, but it's really not, it's really hard to know just how much things have changed. I can find Yuval, Yuval Harari's statements in his books that say, well, we've conquered, we no longer have plague. Oh, tell that to 2020 and 2021. We have plenty of plague around. Well, not plague, but yeah, it's, it's functioning like a plague. So there's a lot going on here, but this is sort of the heart of it. Now let's get back to what Peterson was saying here. That's not even a fiction describes the shape of that pattern. And the See, it's a perennialism. It's the shape of the pattern. And this is where he and Peugeot are really quite next to each other. The greatest of fiction, the greater fiction becomes the more it is religious in nature. And Okay, the more it is religious in nature. Now, if you go to his conversation with Lawrence Krauss, a lot of what's underneath that little and it's a it's a that's a great conversation uh, you know there's there's been so many of them out there that are they're very that are very worthy very much worthy of my time devoted to doing a little bit of commentary on it if the modernists had their own issues and these all these issues get get coded into us in terms of biases and reactions so modernists are allergic to physical concordism and fundamentalists get allergic to talk about myth. Krauss is allergic to small to religion S or how secularists, what religion came to mean in the secular world, which was the certain body of practices, beliefs that where that you could say, oh, those are religious over there, like going to church, saying prayers, lighting candles, lighting candles in church, lighting candles at home would be secular. So, so you divided up the world between the secular and the religious things, and then people over in the secular thought would say, I, this is I'm religion free, and with my Dutch Calvinism and our long history of presuppositionalism, we would sort of look at that and say, well, that's a load of crap. You're not religion free because religion has, and this is again where Peterson is, you know, I, when I began to listen to him very much in alignment with a lot of the, a lot of my own tradition in Dutch Calvinism, right away I had people talking about Cornelius Van Til, presuppositionalism, some of this that came about in the with our Presbyterian cousins. All of these issues that understands that, no, religion isn't about necessarily, you can't segregate religion over there if you exercise talking about God and you don't pray and you don't go to church. Religion is a perennial set of issues and assumptions and ways of approaching the world. Religion as much more as mode of being rather than specific thing over here. And of course, verveke has been, you know, trying to monkey around with with language to help people see this. But this again is part of what Peterson has been good at. And and you know, I can pull up the video where. Someone asks him what religious is, and basically it's the thing that moves you, all right? That's not even a, a claim about the nature of truth. It's more a claim about the nature of experience. See, and, and this question about the nature of truth, again, has everything to do with sort of a, a physicalist concordism. And I forget, I, I wish, you know, I, I haven't been able to assimilate all the fancy verveke words that are out there. But, you know, John has a real good way of talking about this and brought this up quite well, both in his conversation with Jordan and in the Four Horsemen of Meaning video, where basically this, this concordist assumption about truth that really grew out of the empiricist scientific method. So a lot of the conversation that Peterson had with Krauss had to do with these kinds of issues. And so Peterson, again, is this perennialist who has this third way of establishing credibility of the Bible and therefore asserting that some of his moral wisdom teaching has credibility and he sees himself in the Western tradition of reading the Bible because of it. 
you know, when we say something is profound, what we mean is that it's moving and that it has a broad influence. It's capable of having a broad influence on the way we think and see and act. So if you and I think that's a great definition of profound. I, you know, we, we use language and we don't even know what these words mean. Read it's cap moving and that it has a broad influence. It's capable of having a broad influence on the way we think and see and act. So, so in other words, if something is profound, it's underneath us. It, it's, it's sort of, you know, does the world stand still? No, the, the world actually is is spinning at a tremendous rate of speed. Well, then when, when I stand on it, why don't I get dizzy or feel myself moving? Well, it's because everything is moving with you. In a sense, profound means it's deep enough that it's moving not only you, but everything with you in a way that you probably can't recognize or feel right now. So if you read a profound book, like one of Dostoevsky's books, you could say of that book, and people often do, that it changed my life when I read that book. And a story that can change your life has a power that is best described as religious. And so religious is a kind of experience in some sense, rather in addition to a claim about what constitutes It's kind of an experience. It's re religious is so many things. To its truth. And then those stories in Genesis, Cain and Abel, I think, and, and the story of Adam and Eve, because those stories are so deep that it's almost unfathomable. They get at the, at the most profound of patterns. And so to say that they're literally true is actually to massively underestimate how true they are. Okay, so now he's back to these questions of concordism. And to say that they're literally true, no, physically true, he's saying, no, actually, they're, they're really deeply true. And therefore, and as he communicates that and demonstrates that in the biblical lectures, therefore, they have credibility. And once they have credibility, people start to read them and then start to use them as their moral compass. Because you could tell me what you did this morning. Now it would be literally true, but like, who cares? Physically true. Whereas if you read the story of Adam and Eve, it's so true that it applies to everyone always. Now, this is where it gets a little dicey because the modernists and the skeptics had a point that said, if this is never physically true, then you have no reason to pattern how you act after it. In other words, if, well, it's, this rushes in with Jesus' resurrection, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, Apostle Paul makes this argument in 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, what makes you think you will? That's, that's, a, that's a powerful argument. But again, what happened in the fundamentalist in the fundamentalist fight is that everything had to be physically true. Everything. And see now, a number of traditions, including the Roman Catholics, they're, they're not as tied to these fundamentalist questions because their tradition is older than the fundamentalist modernist fight. And that's why it's often a lot of Protestant churches that are younger and Protestant churches, many of our Protestant denominations were born out of this fight to one degree or another. And so that's part of why these things get these things get tangled in many of these Protestant church communities. And mere literal truth can't do that. And we don't have a good language as scientists, let's say, as psychologists or even as citizens. We don't have a good language for that kind of truth. And so, well, I, I guess I'd like your thoughts about that. And, and either I'm getting better in understanding Peterson about this, which is probably happening, or he's getting better at articulating and getting at this, which I think is happening. But this is, 
This is a big part of the issue that we're dealing with now. Idea. Yeah, so the, the literal sense of Scripture is sometimes misunderstood by people. And I think the, the right way to think of it, the literal sense of Scripture, is what the original human author intended to convey to the original human audience. Okay. Authorial intent is not a bad thing. And it is a way to attempt to ground a text, to ground the meaning of the text, by attempting to mind-read the author. Most of the Old Test most of the Old Testament in the the text that we have is anonymous. Now part of the question of Mosaic authorship and the Pentateuch, which suddenly that issue becomes very big in the modernist fundamentalist fights. For this reason, oh, okay, so authorial intent. And, and then and then what, what sometimes tends to happen is you get these is you get these arguments about well, how did the text come to be? And it's it's often called Inscripturation. Ooh, this is too big. Okay. If you look at Islam, well, the angel dictated to Muhammad. If you look at the Latter-day Saints, the special seeing stones allowed Joseph Smith to basically inscripturate. Christianity, at least my tradition, talks rather about organic inspiration. And what that means is that the person who wrote certainly is not overwhelmed or overcome but questions of authorial intent are really difficult because we're arguing over a text that we have in front of us, which was obviously written by um, writers. And again, Christian doctrine says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit uses a lot of things to inspire things. And if we're not only going to look at, if we're going to try to interpret the text via our attempt to mind read the author, it doesn't always help you so much. Again, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to deny the importance of authorial intent, but as I mentioned before, it's quite clear from many New Testament citations of the Old Testament. The New Testament authors believed that Old Testament writers were saying more than they could know because the Holy Spirit was working through them and often that would go under the word prophecy. So authorial intent has its place, but it isn't going to get you out of, every, out of everything. And so if we're looking at Genesis, I think that we need to put Genesis back in its context. If you read Genesis as if... It is a contemporary uh, textbook on science. I think what you're doing is wrenching it out of its original context, and therefore you're bound to misread it. And, and this is a very standard move by people who are trying to take a not a fundamentalist, not a physical concordist fundamentalist approach, nor a um, skeptical modernist approach and say, hey, wait a minute. It's quite clear that there is a polemic behind this text, and both conservative and um, modernist scholars can recognize that and attest to that. And that polemic behind the text is an important aspect of interpretation of the text.
And that's true of not just Genesis, it's really true of any work, that to understand it, we need to understand its genre, and we need to understand its context. So what is the original context of the Genesis story? Well, the original context, it was written in terms of rival stories of creation, other stories that were circulating in the ancient world, and it was meant to be an answer to those. Now, what's interesting is, well, we can go talk about the Church Fathers all we want. The Church Fathers didn't make their argument in this way. This is a fairly modern argument, and partly because we have access to, if you look at Church Fathers in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th century and later, we actually have access to many ancient texts that they didn't have access to. Now, I think they could implicitly understand that nearly every religious text has a polemic aspect to it because it's making an assertion about the way things are. It's making religious assertions, but um, you know, how much did they know of Gilgamesh? How much did they know of ancient Mesopotamian um, cultures that were, in fact, a very long time before them. And it uses poetry, it uses imagery, and that was what all those stories did. And the poetry and the imagery, I would not set that against truth, as if on the one hand you have truth, and the other hand you have poetry, imagery, and story. I think that one kind of truth is scientific truth, the empirically verifiable, but I think it's too narrow to say, well, the only kind of truth is the empirically verifiable. I think truth actually is broader. And in fact, that claim that the only that the truth is empirically verifiable, that's the only kind of truth. That is itself a self-defeating statement, right? There's no empirical evidence that that the only way to get the truth is through the empirical method. So if we put and, and what's interesting is John Verveke in the Four Horsemen video was making a very similar argument to what this um, this scholar was making. And and this argument that he's making has been around a very long time. This has been sort of a a monetarist, uh, um, uh, someone who's a moderate, um, an argument that's saying, well, let's we we don't have to we don't have to polarize along the lines of this modernist fundamentalist fight. We can all recognize a whole range of things about the text, and and conservative scholars and modernist scholars have been you know everyone's been employing the kind of argument that he just made there for quite a while now. Genesis back in its context, what do we see? Well, we see it is a story telling us about, in contrast to the other stories, the other stories in the ancient world were stories in which there were multiple gods, they engaged in a warfare and violence. Now, what he's going to say here, you can probably find me saying it on various videos, and I've made the same statements, but, you know, part of what has changed me over the last few years is, um, yeah, it's the, the, the radical departure of the Hebrews is, in fact, more profound than just this. So you think of the Greek myths are like this, where right Zeus overthrows his father and there's all this violence. And Genesis is meant to answer um, these other ancient myths. And, it and Now, I agree with him completely that Genesis is made to answer these other myths, but this is where I see a lot of the conversations that we've been doing in this little corner of the internet really begin to get beyond sort of these standard answers, because there are always some loose ends of these answers that that sort of remained out there. And uh, yeah, I think when it, when I hear answers like this, to me, these feel, these feel like these are so 2010. It's saying things like there's only one God. There's not multiple. Secondly, that creation is not a matter of violence but that the creation is reasonable speech. And this was something that you talked about in your lecture, which really struck me because I obviously had read that story before, but I never really thought of it that, well, creation arrives, right? God says, let there be light, and there was light. And what is reasonable speech? Reasonable speech is orderly, right? The difference between, you know, random sounds you make and reasonable speech is that there's a kind of order to it. So. If creation arises from reasonable speech, then creation itself is ordered. It's intelligible. It makes sense. And that gives rise, centuries and centuries later, that belief that creation is orderly and makes sense gives rise, centuries later, to science. Mm -hmm. But to read Genesis as if it's failed science makes about as much sense as to read Genesis as if it's you know, for or against iPhones. 
I mean, imagine somebody reading Genesis and they're like, well, is this, should I buy an iPhone or not? I'm not going to read Genesis to determine this. Well, clearly, the original author of Genesis wasn't addressing that. And the original author of Genesis wasn't addressing for or against evolution. And so again, what you hear from this, and you can find me making similar arguments if you go back far enough in the videos, because these are pretty standard answers to the modernist fundamentalist divide. But I think actually what we've got going here in this little corner of the internet are, I, I think we're, I think Peugeot and Verveke, I think we're actually making some more progress on asking more fundamental questions about communication and and embodiment and, and a bunch of the kinds of issues that we're always sort of working on in these thinky talky wonky videos we make. So I think that, that these readers who want to make it for or against evolution are just utterly misreading and taking the, the story out of its original context and therefore necessarily providing a really bad reading of Genesis. So he just signaled, I'm not interested in fighting and I'm not interested in continuing the fundamentalist modernist fight. Um, and yeah, this is, this is a standard answer. There, there, there's also a really important theological point to make here as, as well. And, and that's, I could put it philosophically, what's the condition for the possibility of something being literal in the first place? What's the condition for the possibility both of it being recognized, spoken, and then apprehended? See, now he's starting to get more into, I think, where we've been going. And I found that consistent. Both these guys might watch this video. I've, the years that I've been making these videos have become aware that um, the, 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 the dynamics with scholars and the internet are rather, are rather interesting. Um, but I think the the guy with the blue shirt, I think he's a, I think he's, I think he's been following the conversation a little more carefully. The other guy didn't give a bad answer, but it's sort of the standard answer. And again, I think it's an answer that is starting to um, become dated. There's a certain court of orderliness that's necessarily presupposed in the act of knowing and in the act of communicating that knowledge that itself, as Chris said, can't be empirically verified. So when we as Catholics say that, that recognize from the New Testament that Jesus is the truth, that would include in a literal historical sense, but also the condition for the possibility of anything being intelligible and, and, and literally understood and communicated at all. So I think one of the, the, the frustrations I found in, find in contemporary debates on these questions is that secularism oftentimes isolates and identifies the literal, the empirical, as if this is just a freestanding epistemic platform that belongs to them. And everybody has to uh, uh, compete in order to, to be on their territory. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's been listening to Peugeot and he's trying to put a lot of the points that Peugeot is making in his own words. And I just don't think that's philosophically the case. It presupposes a lot of things that, that they can't give an account for. Yeah. I mean, so, so one more little... Yep. Please go ahead. No, I just was just going to add one thing. So imagine somebody was reading uh, Shakespeare's Sonnet 18, right? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Pretty impressive Shakespeare quoting there. So imagine somebody reads that and they're like, okay, Shakespeare's a, a, a meteorologist. He's a weatherman. And I'm going to look up in the almanac to see if May had rough winds. And that turns out there's no rough winds in May. Oh, Shakespeare, you're about it at, you know, telling us about the weather. Well, I think that's a obviously radically radical misunderstanding of Shakespeare. He's not trying to tell us the weather and then failing to tell us the weather. And so I think Genesis is not trying and failing to give us scientific truths. It's just doing something totally different. And see, and... And again, that I don't think the separate magisterium argument, magisteria argument, really cuts it. There's, I think there's some overlapping magisteria. And I so on the one hand, I, I don't think you can, I don't think you can really, oh, shucks. There we go learning how to use this cool tool. I don't think, 
I don't think you can actually get rid of any of the sides of this. Um, let's pull this one up. I don't. I don't think you can really get away from any of the any of the sides of this argument because there there is in fact some truth over here, and there is in fact some truth over here, and how these play into our contemporary sensibilities about credibility are important and how the credibility, let's see, how do I make this, how do I make this fatter? All right. The credibility, well, it didn't make it a lot fatter. Come on. Oh, use one of these. All right. How the credibility relates to the people's capacity to leverage that credibility as a way to make a morally courageous or challenging move is is really is really quite important. And that's part of the reason yes. I appreciated your lectures is that you highlighted the reality that the author of Genesis is trying not to is trying to communicate very important truths, but not truths that are in the uh, scientific um, discourse. They're true, but not scientific truths. The problem with the empirical approach, the problem with totalizing it is that the empirical... Right there. And, and he has just named the problem with totalizing the empirical approach. And so he is getting, he's looking to get beyond this modernist fundamentalist feud. Approach tends to be mostly descriptions of things and the way they interact and the way they can be manipulated. And... And that's fine, but doesn't tell you, doesn't provide any real insight into how to live, how to act, how to take your next step, how to, how to produce a hierarchy of values and how to determine what's most important and what's least important. And all of that is also so difficult that we actually don't know how to do it completely explicitly which is why we need poetry and drama and literature. We need that whole domain. So we could call that the literary domain. And then I think you could consider it, this might be an empirical proposition, is that the religious domain is at the base of the literary domain. And as literature gets deeper, it becomes more and more like religious writing. See, and I think... Peterson is right here, and this is where he's so helpful, because he notes that if we're actually going to address this logjam that we've been in for 150, 200 years or so, we have to go back and look at the definition of religion and have a better understanding of that, that it isn't something that Lawrence Krauss and and Sam Harris can just sort of segment over to the side. It's far more fundamental and as he's been trying to communicate, and I think getting better at, um, you can't just, you can't just say no. We're we're just gonna, we're just gonna be, we're just gonna be literalists, and the Bible isn't. Uh, it doesn't really help. And so that, by definition, in some sense, and I've swiped this in part, I would say from Jung is almost by definition that the sense of profound engagement that the most profound literature produces is what constitutes the religious. And that's a domain of experience. You know, when you're captivated in a movie theater, when you're captivated by a story, when you're taken outside yourself, none of that has anything to do with logical argumentation. It's a whole different issue. And it, to me, it's tied very, very deeply to our ability to imitate and mimic. And so we're really good. And, and this is where I think Peterson is really at his strongest, where he he knows Jung and he says, now I'm going to take Jung and some of these large, you know, some of these epic mythos, and I'm going to try and take a lot of the newer science and fit that in. And that's that's I think when he gets when he gets compelling good at that way better than any other animal we mit like language is mimicry we use the same words and so we're mimicking each other and but i can't mimic every person separately i have to extract out from each person some essence of being that's admirable 
And I do that person after person, and I try to imitate that. Okay, now we're getting to wisdom generation. And then that core thing that's admirable that I imitate, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's psychologically equivalent to Christ, whatever else Christ is. And that move is Jung, right there. Christ is, that's why he's sometimes described as the king of kings. It's like, if the king is the thing that's at the top of the hierarchy, and then you look at all hierarchies, and you take the thing that's at the top. And that's sort of a um, symbolic appropriation of what, of course, was a standard. I mean, the emperor is the king of kings, but what is the emperor? And so you kind of approach this question from two different directions. Of all hierarchies of value, then that figure, when you see reflections of that figure anywhere, it produces awe and respect. And that's because that pattern constitutes the appropriate way to act, just as when you see the opposite of that pattern, which might be... And, and this is something that I went through in my adult Sunday school class. Let's see if I still have the whiteboard from that. Oh. When you look at... Yeah, here it is. So when you look at Jesus as the king of kings, and this is the big transition, that messiahship for Jesus is different from messiahship for Romulus or even David or or the Maccabees. Messiahship for Jesus was fundamental and it's it's actually this reworking that happens in Christianity that transforms the world in the way that Tom Holland wrote about in his book Dominion in its most fundamental essence, satanic or demonic. It's something that's ultimately evil. We, we have to, one of the things that I have on my to-do list is taking a much better look at what we, actually, if there's one thing I want to talk to James Lindsay about, because he keeps throwing out this word demonic, and apart from it simply being another word for evil, I think we have to have a much better resolution on what exactly are we talking about? And I think you know, I really need to meet, read more Rene Girard because I think Girard was really getting at some important things with his treatment of the tools of the devil as opposed to the tools of Christ. That produces revulsion and terror, and that's, that's all instinctual. It's, it's not in the domain of rationality precisely. It's way, way deeper than that. And the, 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 the atheist... And then there's another problem that the atheists have never come to terms with, I, I believe, and you guys tell me what you think of this, is that if, if what is rendered, if, if what is properly rendered unto God is rendered unto Caesar, then Caesar becomes inflated to God. And this, I love this point that he makes here. When that happens, all hell breaks loose. That's the genesis of totalitarianism. That's subservience to an idol. Now, this again, now his concern about the whole left in the culture. And again, James Lindsay recently did a, he has these monologue podcasts that he does. I wasn't even, I knew that he had started a podcast, but I really didn't know what he was using the podcast for until Kale Zeldin said, you got to listen to this one. James Lindsay wants to talk theology. Yeah, the new atheists, they're, um, they're wanting to talk theology now. Isn't that interesting? Because they're realizing there's a hole in the middle of the culture that the church left behind. There's a hole in the middle of the culture that theology and the Bible left behind. And what happens is that your politics and your other things sort of swell to fill that hole. And when that happens, you have exactly the issue that Peterson keeps pointing to, that you're taking, and this is very Augustinian language, you're taking, you know, you're taking secondary things and turning them into primary things. And when you do that, all hell will break loose, as he says. And so, and this is a case I think the church needs to make, particularly the Catholic church, in the most strenuous of ways is that And this is where I say, uh, Jordan, number one, it's a little, the Catholic Church of all churches, I mean, there is so much history about this issue that 
he never addresses. Again, I've been reading, I've been reading, you know, some of the, I've been reading about the French Revolution. So much that happens in the French Revolution revolves around these issues. What happened in Quebec revolves around these issues. To have the Roman Catholic Church stand up and say, we deserve to be at the center of the culture, when, well, even just the history of the Roman Catholic Church in America and, and why, there's a reason why Protestantism, why America was deeply Protestant, well, has been deeply Protestant really until the middle of the 20th century. And the Roman Catholics have really come on strong, but the, the, the way that the Roman Catholic Church functioned in Europe, and I don't mean just churches in the middle of the town square, that's certainly a part of it, but the way in which the, the, the thousand years of struggle between emperors and popes, there's a ton of history here that, you know, just kind of Jordan saying, well, the church should do, especially the Roman Catholic Church, it's like, It's sort of like me saying, well, we got all these mentally ill, drunk people outside my door. Where are the psychologists? And, well, fair enough. You know, certainly psychologists and therapists should be on the front line of dealing with the, the, the mentally ill and the, and the people with drug habits that are lining our streets. But it's, it, you know, you, if you would point them in that direction, they'd say, whoa. It isn't just a matter of throwing therapists at the homeless. Oh, that makes for an interesting image. There's a whole lot going on here. So I am unfortunately out of time. Uh, let's see, I'm 2437 into this. Will I return to it? I've, I am doing a, a video for a conference in Australia. I'm obviously not going to Australia now in the middle of COVID right now for that conference, but I'm doing a video for them. That's taking time this week. I've had a lot of other pastoral things that I've had to do this week. Uh, we have an extra holiday this week. Um, I'm starting to line up conversations for January. I've got a lot of requests for conversations. So, you know, I in an ideal world, I would sit down and I would I would make my way through the two hours and three minutes, and, and this video probably deserves it. There's some really important points in this video, but I, I wanted to I wanted to really get at. Oh, let me pull up the correct slide. I wanted to really get at this issue because Jordan continues to ask. Oh shucks, come on, stay there. Jordan continues to ask. Put him right in his back place. Okay. Jordan continues to ask, well, why are my why were my biblical lectures so powerful? I think this is the reason. He was practicing a different concordism. The concordism in the modernist camp is sort of totally breaking down, and there's been other new religions, namely wokeism, that has, in many respects, you know, completely begun to colonize this whole this whole area of the church. Oh, my pen stopped. See, this is the problem when I start playing with these new toys, I get distracted. And the disconnect with the moral application and the disconnect with wisdom had basically left them vulnerable to ideological possession and that ideological possession basically inflamed then their relationship with Jordan Peterson for all of the and this is for all of the difficulties with the fundamentalist position with their ardent demand of physical concordism I think there I think that has actually given fundamentalists a better mooring for enduring the changes of time because I think it is psychologically and morally easier for the fundamentalists to 
take a look at the Jordan Peterson brand of Concordism and say, yeah, I can live with that, than it is for the modernists because part of what happened is that they sort of completely lost the entire structure. And, and again, back to the upper and lower register, if you lose the lower register, the top sense tends to float off. Now, you've got Protestants all over this map, of course. And, you know, perhaps, but not always, you know, some of the older traditions, like the Orthodox and the Catholics, managed to, to keep some of this stuff together and keep their feet under them. Well, good for them without necessarily losing things. But but the Catholics had other things that were mooring them. And I think in the case, in both of their cases, their sacramentalism was mooring them rather than, let's say, the, the physical concordism that the fundamentalists have been used. But at least they had some ballast that in many ways protected them from these changes in history. So this was this was a this was an important part of the first segment of the conversation they had. And I thought it was worthwhile, at least. I, I've been trying to articulate it, and I'd use concordism, and people would write me and say, what, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I hope, hopefully, after this video, you'll have an understanding, and you'll have a better understanding of the historical development of this dynamic that I have on the screen in front of you, and a better understanding of why I think Jordan Peterson lended credibility to the Bible, in the art in the way that he did so so i'm out of time for now leave a comment let me know if this was helpful